Everybody scream, I'm losing it. I don't know about you, but I've been bitten, getting delivered, 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 delivered uh, through our investigation of the word of God concerning who he is and what he wants and what he does and what he said. And so much has been blessing me um, that I have been willing to almost renounce my experience in the scriptures to see it anew and afresh. And to do that has literally revolutionized my life and I so hope that it's impacted you in the same way. Uh, because it's taken to investigate this stuff, Evangelist Nate, to find out that there is a clear explanation between our distance with God and a very clear explanation by, behind why obeying God or the thought of obeying God produces fear. If you think about it, when you see God right, wanting to obey him should be a palatable thing. But when you are challenged to obey him and the reaction is fear, it's because you see him wrong. We're taught him wrong. Obeying God can never put you in a danger that he cannot deliver you out of. Um, and so I've just fallen in love with the word of God again. And uh, that doesn't seem like much to you, uh, but 1999 is when I first started preaching the gospel. And I love the word of God more now than I did then. It has become everything I've ever needed. And uh, I often talk about that here because I want to impart that same love for you uh, or in you uh, and in your children that we have a testament and we have a record of the faithfulness of God. I was reading in the book of Revelations yesterday. Don't get nervous because I'm not preaching that today. But I was reading in the book of Revelation yesterday where John said, and if anybody adds to this, and if anybody takes away from this, the plagues of this book belong to them. And I had not realized how common it is to add and subtract from the word of God. But it's so powerful, it doesn't need addition. And it's so meaningful, it doesn't need subtraction. It just is. And, and so I love the word of God. And I abhor religion. I invited somebody to church yesterday and they said, you know, I really don't do religion. I said, well, you're perfect because I don't either. It, it disgusts me. And uh, so he didn't want to come, but he said he would watch anyway. I feel a shift in this church and I feel like there is a new compelling power coming to those that had turned away from the gospel. They're getting ready to turn back to this glorious gospel. I said they're getting ready to turn back to this glorious gospel because it is a glorious one. Uh, in case you've been under a rock, we've been in a series called Losing My Religion, and it has really, really, really uh, drawn a whole bunch of people close to the Lord. And we're going to continue this discussion today. Um, I'm going to be preaching one segment of scripture that I have so much information from. I've got to separate it from part one and part two. I'm going to do my best to do that today. Uh, but we're going to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading it again in the message version, in the message version. Uh, the message version offers so much with understanding the passionate intent of the writers, particularly when you're dealing with religion and tradition. We're going to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and I want you to find yourself at verse 25. At verse 25 of Luke's Gospel in the 10th chapter in the message version. If you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, say, hola. Here goes a reading of God's word. Just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? In the KJV, it, it, they're asking, what is the most important commandment? What is the most important commandment? He said that you love the Lord your God, this is the message version, with all your passion. In KJV it says heart and prayer. In, in, in the message or in the KJV it says soul 
and muscle. In the KJV, it says strength. And intelligence. In the KJV, it says mind. So that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence. And that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Verse 28 says, good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you will live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, uh, and just how would you define neighbor? <laughs> Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite, religious man, showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. But a Samaritan traveling the road came, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I love your word. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Father, your word is life to me. Help me to preach this in Jesus' name. Amen. The second part of this uh, chapter is going to get a bit dangerous, so I'm not going to touch it to 11. Uh, but what I'm going to do is give you the first segment of this, and just for the sake of our study, what we're learning and tackling today is the greatest commandment. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that phrase, the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment. Uh, let's start with a bit of controversy here. The Ten Commandments are not the foundation of Christianity. Let's do some work. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and then they were given to Israel in Exodus, the 20th chapter. And although there are over 600 Old Covenant laws, the bedrock of them all is the Ten Commandments, what you and I refer to as the Ten Commandments. And uh, these were the birth point and almost the spine of all morality, all civility in the old covenant, both secular and spiritual world. When God gave Moses the writings, what the historians called the Decalogue, he was not just aiming it to, defining what morality would be to those that named him. They would also become the point of judgment and the point of consequence for the heathen nation. In other words, the reason God's judgment uh, and consequence would be beckoned upon people that did not believe with him was determined by their interactions or avoidance of the Ten Commandments. Say yes. And so this was a law given to a people but meant for all people in the old covenant world uh, because the way God led them out is that uh, there were rules and there were edicts in the Ten Commandments that had to do with every angle of human life. There, it starts off with divine law. You have only one God. Then it went into sociological law. This is how you treat and entreat the people around you. But then it went to familial law or genetic law. And so it encompassed the totality of all of the human nature and experience. And so the Ten Commandments as you and I know it upon Sinai was God's first articulation uh, to the human race concerned Learning what an integral legal system should be. Just stay with me. That would become the basis for every crime punishable by law. Even in 21st century culture, you can trace back most, not all, of the laws that nations operate by to one of the 600 laws of the Old Covenant down to the treatment of our foreigner. I'm not going to get there yet, but uh, there were rules in the books of exodus about how you and I once we came into a certain economic status we were to leave something behind so that when the foreigner came they would not 
die in the field. I'm not preaching policy, I'm preaching the scripture. But the Bible say there were rules for even foreign exchange. You could find them rooted in the Ten Commandment. Um, and so the social standing and the premise, even for theological framing, was expressed upon Sinai. The whole concept of having a monotheistic culture, uh, meaning that if and when and wherever you give and share and distribute your spirituality to whatever deity makes sense to you uh, then that culture will invite upon itself a destructive consequence because they rely on more than one thing for their outcome scream yes and so this is why the first of the Ten Commandments is in order to do uh, any of this that's listed here, uh, you've got to realize and resolve and reiterate and rehearse and repeat that none of this is possible if you have more than one God. This is why he starts out by saying you are only to have one God and don't put another before me. Uh, because if ever you put another before me, uh, you're going to live cyclically because you don't even have the power you don't have the health you don't have the strength to do laws 2 through 10 if you cannot resolve that law number 1 is that you've got to have one God now I'm trying to not get excited but when you do this put your long finger in the face of somebody that wants some stocking stuffers on the chimney and tell them I've only got one will you say that Look at somebody else and tell them there is only one. I want you to know that. And the reason I'm reiterating that is because you are in a culture where more than one thing likes to act like it's got control over your destiny. Sometimes it's your mama. God be praised. Sometimes it's your daddy. Sometimes it's your struggle. Sometimes it's your battle. Sometimes it's your, your resume. Other times it's your diagnosis. But put your hand in your own, your own face and say, I've only got one what that means is that your destiny is not in the hand of two or three and your destiny is not in the hand of four or five people can come and go and stay and leave but at the end of the day I've only got one and the name of my one is Yeshua HaMashiach the one who was slain before I got here it was before I am the Lord and don't you ever put nobody else before me and so you will find out that uh, this is, is, is what many people act as if is the, the beginning and the birthplace of our Christianity but if you look at it uh, uh, integrally Pastor David you can't have a Christianity before you've got a Christ. So although these, 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 these uh, constitutional edicts that uphold and explain what peace is and what social and relational and economic life should look like, these laws became the reason for the judgment and the penance and the penalties, not just of individuals, Pastor Tasha, but in some cases entire families. If, for example, one member of a family violated one of the law, uh, in certain ones of the laws of Moses, uh, there would be consequence upon many members of a family uh, because of the disrespect of the law of one member. Say yes. Now, as we translate this into understanding why this is a new covenant issue, it's because very often uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which are, by the way, two of the three culturally militant political parties, uh, they were the Bible's version of the Republicans and the Democrats, and then there was another group who was kind of independent. Uh, and so they were the political movements that basically governed all of civilian and all of religious and all of military life in Israel and very often these two groups would use what you and I call the law of Moses as the 
only premise uh, for testing Jesus. They couldn't do nothing with his miracles and they couldn't do nothing with his following. Uh, so what they would do, watch me, is they would try to find a particularity. They would try to fight him in a technicality to make sure that they could trap him up with violating not just the rules that were applicable to the church, but they wanted to trap him in his worldview. Say yes. And they knew that if they could prove uh, that Jesus had a worldview uh, that was opposite from the majority, uh, then what they could do was decrease his momentum, uh, prove that he was not worth following, uh, and hopefully cause people to remain faithful to old covenant Judaistic thinking and behavior. <laughs> Because if they stayed faithful to that behavior, then there would be no loss of power in their own party. But the more he increases, the weaker our agenda gets. So if we can't trap him with this water, and we can't do nothing about him defending prostitutes, let's use the law of Moses to restrict the movement that he has. Let's create, as it were, a, 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 a battle. Hallelujah. Let's create a tension point between Moses and the Messiah notwithstanding that one of the first people to talk about the Messiah was not John the Baptist Moses told us in old covenant books uh, that there's coming one after me Moses told y'all don't look to me like I'm the one whose back this thing is going to be built uh, but there is a prophet coming after me and the problem is we've not looked for the one that was coming after Moses and we've not realized that Moses was a shadow of the one he was supposed to represent I want you to see uh, that in order for them to, to, to legally reject the teaching of the kingdom and the revelation of Christ as Messiah 90% of Jesus' resistance was born from Sadducees and Pharisees now in order order for you to understand why this is important uh, you got to realize that Jesus came to the earth uh, and he may have abdicated his physical form uh, but he came here with all power he did not have demonic resistance one time you will never find uh, where Jesus walked up to a demonize anything and they told him hold up wait a minute every time he spoke to hell hell obeyed so where did his resistance come from it didn't come from demons demons were no problem for Jesus I love your word and if they wasn't a problem for him then they show sure in hell ain't a problem for him now I don't care what kind of devil you dealing with in your life deliverance from addiction is easier than what they preach deliverance from insanity is easier than what they preach I'm here to tell you deliverance from lust is easier than what they think but detoxing from from religion is harder than deliverance. 90%, I got 15 minutes, 90% of Jesus' resistance, the people fighting him is crazy because demons introduced him and didn't fight him. They're like, hey, Jesus, we know who you are. Just don't come over here, please. But you find that politically and relationally and even on a media sense, a lot of the stuff that happened to resist him, to, to keep him out, came from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You also find in a very astounding manner uh, that 95% of Jesus' rebukes uh, were for the beliefs that were rooted in people's interpretation of the law of Moses. They would always come to him and say, Moses said this, but what do you say? And Moses said this, but what do you say? And Moses said this, and what do you say? You know, this is fascinating to me uh, because when the disciples came to him, Kenza, and they were excited about the fact that devils were coming out, Jesus said this, I'm going to try not to run on this Christmas. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That was the only thing he said. And do you know how fast Satan moves? Now, he spent time laboring in doctrine, but he saw Satan fall real fast in other words the freedom that is hard is not from invisible enemies but it's from tangible lies that's mixed with some truth and misappropriate interpretation of the most important power on earth so now we understand 
that these groups were not weak groups. They had money, they had soldiers. Socially speaking, they were very powerful, very affluent. But allegedly, the basis of their influence was the constitution that held Israel together, the law of Moses, the trends, the law of Moses. So their charges were always based upon him. Down to the day he got murdered or he allowed himself to die, uh, the premise of their accusation before their kings were high crimes and treason. And they wanted to use the statements about him being a king and the statements about him being a ruler ruler as the basis to prove that he was a national traitor, as the basis to prove that he had disrupted not just their spiritual beliefs, but their national constitution. And so the reason I had to paint that picture to you is so that you would not Dr. Seuss this powerful text, because now it makes sense why this one conversation is mentioned in Matthew, God be praised, and then is mentioned again in Mark, God be praised. And then you find it in Luke. I love your word. And then it's also in John. That means in every one of the synoptic gospels, even though they were written decades apart from each other, all of them remembered when Jesus said, I'm going to teach you the greatest commandment. All of them recall the day where he said, I'm about to sum up the summary and I'm about to give you the sum and bonum of what it means to be like me. Because it's very possible get ready to be offended to call yourself following the Ten Commandments and not be like Jesus the way we preach it is that the Ten Commandments transforms you into the knowledge of the Son of God but following the Ten Commandments makes you just as righteous as Moses but you can be as righteous as Moses and still not be like the Messiah I need about 20 people in here to go old school and put your hands on your chest and and just say I want to be like him come on just say that if the person next to you ain't said it don't get mad go old school go to a storefront real quick and say just to be like him just to be like him I don't want to be like who's like him I've got to be like him and in 2020 Jesus has got to be your goal Jesus has got to be your standard Jesus has got to be your pre pre premise it's got to be your justification he's got to be your foundation he's got to be your rights he's got to be your privileges he's got to be your answer he's got to be your measuring stick he's got to be your parenthesis he's got to be your backbone it's got to be Jesus and you'll find out that whenever you build anything else on anything but the rock you're going to sink but my sinking days have come to an end because I built my house upon the rock whose name is Christ Jesus somebody say hallelujah watch me do it in 10 minutes So now our text opens with not just a member of the Pharisee and the Sadducee, but this particular member was also a lawyer. It's one thing to be a scholar, but it's another thing to be a scholar and a lawyer. So this is a master attorney who has developed a career on proving his points. One of the things that a lawyer must learn to do is defend his argument whether it's right or wrong. You got to understand that even wicked people have to have lawyers that find weaknesses in the opposing argument. So a lawyer has no side. A lawyer is basically a middle arbiter arbitrator whose job is to use the situation uh, that's been given to them uh, and to prevent the opponents uh, or the opposing team uh, from penetrating the argument. Uh, the premise of the lawyer's career is the argument. Uh, the basis of the lawyer's career is the argument uh, and not just the argument uh, but the presentation of said argument. Uh, I'm going to spend weeks in investigation stay with me to make sure that I have considered every possible angle you'll have so that by the time I've got in a courtroom 
I pre-know how you're going to try uh, to interact with my argument. So we got an arguing man among the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees that stands up prophet Reese with what he thinks is going to be rhetoric I love your word he does not anticipate that the man is going to have an answer but he would have done better had he included in his study uh, that one of the way one of the things Jesus said he was was the answer God I love your word and the answer ain't never not got an answer you ain't gonna ever find Jesus shrugging his shoulder because he is the way and he is the truth and he is the light the lawyer didn't know that he was talking to the answer he was trying to trap the answer by not having the answer but when he got before Jesus he said let me ask you a question Mr. Jesus what is the most important commandment uh, which of the ten do you say we should follow since you running around here healing on the Sabbath and you're running around here hanging with all these drunk folk or you're running around here with such disreputable scum I want to know which one is the most important and Jesus being the kind of a God he is he looks at the lawyer and he tells him I'm going to summarize the summary now what I mean by that is that even with as many laws as you'll have it's still a summary what we have in them 600 laws is a summary and it's the best of man's ability to comprehend the holiness of God. It is the limitations of the human mind. We're trying to understand what God is and how he is what he is. So holiness reduced becomes the law and explained it becomes the Ten Commandments. The objective is to get holy. So what we have in the Old Testament is a very 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 narrow and a very 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 juvenile and a very 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 elementary way of describing the holiness of God <laughs> and so what happens now is that if you got a generation uh, that only wants to do uh, the very minor and the very juvenile uh, then they've lost view of what our real goal is uh, our real goal is not to be right in front of men uh, and our real goal is not to be normal in front of men uh, our real goal and our highest potential is the holiness of God uh, but because I can't get there on my own and I don't have a holiness to have I've got to come to him and become a partaker of his divine nature when people enter the law they think that they change their own nature but the Bible calls us a partaker which means we go to a table we eat the bread of holiness and we become it because we've received it we do not study it to be it we go to him and this is why Hebrews says who Whoever comes to God uh, must believe that he is. Uh, I want somebody in here to get free because you ain't, but he still is. Uh, and even though you ain't, you can because he did. Uh, he that coming to God must believe that he is. And uh, he is a rewarder of them that diligently. I'm about to summarize the summary, preaching power. I'm about to give you the main point I'm about to interpret. I'm about to give you the, expo the expositional definition of what the law of Moses really was trying to say. I'm about to decode it for you. Jesus said, I want you to love the Lord your God. I feel like preaching in here. That means that before church became what it is today, before ministry became what it is today, before denominations became what it is today, uh, Jesus' intention uh, was that the goal would be you come in here as a hater of God uh, and you learn how to love God. Uh, now this sounds simple to you, uh, but this is an ancient objective of Jesus Christ. Uh, people are supposed to leave sin uh, and come in the house of God to learn to love God. Uh, can I preach like I want to? Uh, you were not born uh, with the desire to love God. Uh, you were not born with the power to love God. Uh, you were not even born with the appetite to love God. Uh, you don't understand that you can't love God uh, until you first realize that he loves you. Uh, so what that means is that we got a reverse experience uh, in most churches uh, where we teach and preach uh, and act as if uh, that the way to get God to love you uh, is that you got to live like 
like you love him. But in this kingdom, it does not work that way. You're supposed to come around until you believe that he loves you. Until you hear that he loves you. Until you see that he loves you. And then your love for him becomes a reaction. I love your word. And it becomes a response. But when we preach and when we teach, like you got to initiate loving God, what we do is we make men, women, boys, and girls drive on a very empty tank. Ask me why. You don't even know how to love your mama right. You don't know how to love your daddy right. You barely love yourself right. So the house of God is supposed to be a place where the empty tank of the heart of a man can come in the presence of God and say, who wouldn't serve a God like this? The kind of a God that knows all about me and still loves me. The kind of a God that I didn't choose and he still chose me. The kind of a God that tells me according the Jeremiah one. I've got an in vitro plan for you. And before I formed you, I said before I formed you, before I formed you, I knew you. And because I knew you then, I'm going to still love you now. I wish I had some. Lift your hands. Say he loves me. Sit down. Woo! I wished. I'm about to get in trouble, Pastor Will. I wish I learned that God loved me when I came to church. I didn't love that. I didn't learn that. You know what I learned? Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. That if I didn't get right, he was gonna kill me. What I learned of is if I didn't hurry up, I was gonna get right or get left. I, I, I learned everything that I needed to muster in my own strength and power in order for him to turn his love on or off. But the Bible says, beloved, let us love one another for God is love and everyone that loveth is born of God. For he that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. Which means if you come in the church and you don't find love, you did not find God. I'm walking in here. I spent all my life trying to get the man to love me. I took communion on first Sundays trying to get the man to love me. I repented every morning for every sin I could think of and the ones I was scared to go to sleep with because he was going to kill me. And I didn't want the deaf angel to come and give me an asthma attack because I just got done cussing. But I've been liberated from a law that I cannot keep up. And I've thrown myself. I said I've thrown myself myself uh, into the reckless I can't get help uh, unexplainable uh, unimaginable uh, love of God uh, slap three people say throw yourself in come on say throw your hey 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 I got some more message throw yourself in uh, throw yourself in uh, stop trying to understand it uh, and throw yourself in uh, stop trying to feel it uh, and throw yourself in uh, the Lord loves me Monday uh, loves me Tuesday uh, loves me Wednesday uh, even on Thursday, huh? he loved me on Pentecost, huh? loved me on Easter, huh? loved me on Thanksgiving, huh? even on St. Patrick's Day. Huh? The Lord loved. Slap three people say, He loves me, He loves me, He loves me. Woo! Sit, hey, hey. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. That's how you grow your church. You tell them the Lord loves you. That's how you stretch your movement. You tell them the Lord loves you. And you demonstrate the love of God. Have a seat. Please. I'm summarizing the summary. Jesus said this is the most important commandment. Love the Lord your God. Why, Lord, have mercy to me. And you've got to love him in several realms. And you've got to love him in several ways. The first realm you've got to love him is with all of your hearts. You can't just tell God I love you 
because he is the originator of love. You got to love him how he want to be loved. I feel like I said you got to love him how he want to be loved. And God don't want to be loved the same way you want to be loved. He wants a multi-dimensional, I can't get help, multi-faceted, very broad love affection. And the first place he wants to be loved is in your passions. Have a seat. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your heart. With all your heart. Which means that when I come to God, one of the things I should be doing is learning to love God with everything I want. I want my passions to reflect my love of God. I don't want to love God just because I need him. I want to love God because I want to want the things that he wants. That's loving God with all of your heart. And many Christians around the world have not been taught that they are living half-hearted. So what they do is they come to church with a half, hallelujah. They come to church with a half, thank you Jesus, with a half, yes, with a half have surrender but Jesus said if I summarize all these laws uh, all they're trying to do is get you to love God with everything you want uh, and get to the place of intoxication uh, where if you've got a passion that ain't from him uh, you hate that passion because you love him more and then he says I want you to love him with all of your soul uh, and what is left the realm of your heart uh, you've got to love him with your inner man and your desire you've got to love him with the things that you crave you got to love him with the things that you train yourself to crave and then here's a real fun one he says you got to love him with your strength in other words you got to live and grow and learn and mature until your tiredness is not an excuse not to love him until your exhaustion is not an excuse not to love him some of you have been loving God up until you're tired but you got to learn to train your life that when I'm tired I've got to love him a little more because because he is my strength will you pinch somebody in here that needs some strength right now and tell them the Lord is my strength oh, come on help me St. Agnes somebody in here is growing just a little weak I dare you to slap somebody and put some strength in them and tell them he is my strength here's my favorite here's my favorite here's my favorite let her lay. Here's my favorite. One of the favorite areas, Elder Enoch, that the Lord loves to be loved in uh, is our mind. He loves to be loved in your intelligence. He loves to be loved in your comprehension. He loves to be loved in your analysis. And that's the one place that many Christians hate him. Because we are the type of people that only love what we can understand. Glory to the Son of God. But you got to love God when you don't understand him. You got to love God when you can't trace him. You got to love God when you realize he is omnipotent. And he is omniscient. And he is omnipresent present and he's everywhere all the time and he never makes a mistake so most of us know that we should love God and praise and worship but not with our mind and not with our heart and not with our soul and not with our strength we don't want to love him in our mind because that's the one place that religion wants to teach us that we are hated the opposite then the opposite then the opposite then of love is hate. If I come to church and that gospel and that culture and that attitude and that approach does not convince me that God loves me, then it deepens the assumption that he probably hates me. After all, when I make mistakes, I get closer and closer to hell. So what that teaches me in is to live a life of no mistake. Live a life of perfect calculation. Live a life that does not allow you to be freed up in your humanity. Live a perfect life, but don't do it with a perfect God. You see, the way we built the whole thing is backwards. Because we put requirement at re the door and relationship in the grave. The love of God is the core premise of all of our Christianity. In those ways, now here is where my real preacher is so into this. This is where it's going to get dangerous. 
And Jesus said, when you come to church, you become a follower of mine. The greatest commandment is not what day you worship and taking your neighbor's donkey and honor your mama that your days might be long. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with everything you got, heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is just as great as this one. This is, this is organic Christianity. Love your neighbor. That's not where I'm about to crack in. As. Here is where we're about to get hurt. Here is where we're going to get hurt, Rekina. We're going to get hurt because 80% of you don't need any more help hating yourself. And unfortunately, what I was taught was holiness was actually self-hate. wrong nobody needs revelation that they dirty even before you got a bible you have a conscience that was placed in you by God to steer you so when the gospel is the wages of sin is death which is not the gospel at all when the gospel is this is the consequence of doing it your way it does not point to God it points to you. The unfortunate truth is many of us learned self-hate in the church. And the way the religious spirit acts is, listen, I can't change you if I don't make you hate you. So we've been hating people to heaven, hating people to altars, hating people to conferences, hating people to change sexual orientation. We've been hating people to tithe, hating people to join. We use hate, which is the weapon of hell, to try to heal people. But hate ain't never healed nobody. Now you're like, I didn't learn how to hate myself. Yes, you did. It's just called condemnation. And what condemnation is, is a theology a doctrine, a practice that infuses self-hatred. Can I take this a little deeper? Self-love is one of the goals of Jesus. Now that makes you feel weird here because you think self-love and hear self-worship. But I can love myself and not worship myself. This culture is full of self-worship and they're trying to act like it's self-love but it's really national narcissism on a whole generation and the reason we do it there is because we don't love. <laughs> Fundamentally speaking, Christianity was about pulling people out of hatred of self because if you believe that you've been made in the image and likeness of God then there's nothing about you that you should hate. I feel a chill in here because there's a lot of you that prophesy you hate yourself some of you cast out devils and hate yourself some of you preach dance shout and you got some unresolved decades of belief that helps you hate yourself it, it, it pulls together the powers of guilt and shame and teaches you to always be perplexed about why God loves you. I used to have that same weak belief too. I don't know why Jesus loves me. No, I know exactly why Jesus loves me. It's because I look like him. And when I got saved, I stopped looking like Matthew and Lewis and Stevenson and the third. And I took on the nature of the manifest son of God because he loves me because I'm like him. The fundamental problem you're still struggling to believe that you'll like him because of what you got to work on. You don't believe that you'll like him because you still have bad habits. You still don't believe you'll like him because every now and then you got to struggle. But as long as you believe in the Son of God, sent through a virgin birth, down through 42 generations to redeem and ransom a nation of people, you are like him. Our gospel makes us feel like you have to put fleshly effort into being like him or else he'll hate you. But the way you're made is that you are permanently 
eternally attached to God. Listen to me. Which means that if you believe that God hates you, either because of what's happened to you or what, ha or what has not happened yet, or either because of how you are or what you did or what was done, if you have that anywhere in your head, that thing has authority in your heart and it becomes the anchor of your own self-hatred. Why does the church help people hate themselves? Why do we get fulfillment out of affirming and validating your right to feel hated? A century of teachings, which is why this generation's backsliding comes to no surprise. We've been hating them since Pentecost. That was the greatest commandment. Learn to love me so that you can learn to love you. And then once, here is where we're going wrong in friendships, in romantic relationships, in family relationships. We are starting from insufficient funds. Trying to love them. And we ain't got good enough at loving us. This is why you struggle with bitterness. It has nothing to do with your inability to forgive them. You just don't love yourself enough to decide that nothing they do is worth your internal peace. So it's not that you're unforgiving. It's not that you're bitter. It's not that you're stubborn. You hate yourself. So you just don't have enough. To love them I am flabbergasted as I throw myself into this because it means that one of Jesus' original goals was I'm coming to the world and after they've learned to love me they'll learn to love them now I know they are not gonna like themselves enough to love them so hopefully if they love me they believe what I see about them and then from that spout of love of, of self-value and love, they have enough to give. The church don't have enough to give. That's why people come in and can't feel it. Hear good preaching and can't feel it. And they can't feel it because the people trying to give it have self-hate. This has been here all the time. They will know that you're mine, not by what you wear and what you sing. They'll know you're mine because. So the first part of this is if we're going to course correct the paradigm of Christianity, we've got to create a real path and a real template for self-love. And the beginning of self-love is not knowledge of self. It's revelation of God. It is the honesty that, Lord, I have no clue what the heck you've been doing with me or why I am or where I don't know. But what I know is that you're good. That's the starting point. And if you stay there long enough, love will start to, let's work through it mathematically. It'll start to work through my mind, my heart, my soul, my strength, and then it's going to hit everything else at that point I'm full so somebody can wrong me and I don't feel as wronged as I should be I wish I had help I don't have help somebody can steal from me and I don't feel robbed somebody can disrespect me and I don't feel dishonored because I have more to when you feel the immediate impact of people's criminal behavior to you, it's a sign that you don't love yourself. If you don't ever buy me a birthday card, I love myself. If you don't ever say thank you, I'm thanking myself. 
and you're so afraid of pride that you reduce the absolute masterpiece that you are. You're not even smart enough to make you how you make you. This is why you got to love him so that you can believe his narrative about you. The future, hey, hey. The future changes the past. The future changes the past. There are things that you face in your life that you feel like are excruciating. In a couple of years, you're going to see that they were of absolute necessity. The problem is, if you hurt, the love of God is like an intoxicant. When things go wrong or unexpected around you, you don't throw yourself into problem meditation. That's how you become brain, you, that's brain damage. Don't, when you focus on your problems, you reduce the capacity of your cells. What you do is you throw yourself in the love of God. I don't know why this happened, but I know you love me. You've always loved me. My breath is a sign that you love me. My health is a sign. The Holy Ghost is a sign that you love me. You love me so much, the moon, the sun, they, they know it. They, they bring me mercy. When I was in sin, they used to bring me judgment. I used to hate to wake up, but now that I love you, when the sun comes up, it reminds me that instead of a day meeting me with my consequence, it meets me with a beckon to come closer. Fundamentally, our problem is not just evangelistic. Our problem, when I say our, I'm not talking about all nations, I'm talking about in Christianity is we demonstrate a gospel that teaches people to hate themselves. That's how it works. Hate yourself. Hate yourself. Hate yourself. It's holiness or hell. Can I make you mad? Can I make you mad? It's not holiness or hell, it's holiness or help. I said it's not holiness or hell, it's holiness or help. Because we made people scared of hell, we thought that that meant that they were holy. The more afraid you are of hell, the more holy you are. No, Doc, I love him. And maybe I'll strive the rest of my days, but at some point, I'm going to get this thing right. And I'm not going to perform for anybody. I'm simply, I'm going to love him. Next time somebody asks you what you called to do, say love him. Somebody asks you what type of season you're in, I'm learning to love him. I used to go to church for y'all, but now I go because I want to learn to love him. And when I learn to love him here, I want to learn how to love him there. We're in a place where we're learning how to love God. God in and with our strength our strength some of us understand okay God you want my passion you want my will apparently but when I get tired that justifies inconsistency or irresponsible behavior on my part I'm tired and maybe you're not out there saying I'm physically tired but if you've ever given up or thought to it was your way of not loving God with your strength I'm not giving up because I love him. My assignment this morning is to pull you out of a cycle of self-hatred. I know it don't sound impressive, but many of you don't realize how much of that is there. A sign that it's there is this. How did she and I not? Why do they and I don't? If you live in self-hatred, your relationships cannot even go deep. Self-sabotage is a form of it. If you, if, you, if you fall Monday, Malcolm, there. If you fall Monday and by Thursday, you've not released yourself, you've not removed yourself from the power and the pressure of that, it is a manifestation of self-hate. It works like this. If you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I did wrong. I repent. <laughs> what he does is he says, I love you. Thanks for recognizing it. And then he turns your behavior around and draws you near 
unto himself. Lift those hands all over the building. I said lift those hands all over the building. Throw them hands up all over the building. And what I'm challenging you to do is to allow the Holy Ghost to show you any area in your life where self-hatred has operated. It's not always, when you think self-hatred, you may think I cut myself or I, I'm on drugs or, but any area in your life where value has not grown because of the things that make you human and the things that make you a person on earth, the greatest consequence is this if you don't learn how to love yourself as you get closer to destiny you'll be so busy disqualifying yourself that you won't do a good job at it so you can be walking toward your calling and then convincing yourself every day I don't, I'm not I can't that grows into disobedience because then when new assignments come out on the earth you're so busy weighing and measuring your skill and status and age and race and all of that that you don't respond with just a mindless yes Lord that's the place he's calling you into we're going to worship but there are people in your family that need to be loved better there are people on your job that need to be loved better there are people on your road that need to be loved better and the truth is you just don't have it but you can get it. You've got to love yourself. And when you love yourself, what happens is discipline becomes a desire. Health becomes a desire. Somebody could criticize you and say you are out of order. You, you laugh. Be like, yeah, I'm right. Self-love will make you less sensitive. Somebody says to you, hey, that was off. You'd be like, oops. Instead of, you betray me, I might trust. See, you're going to crisis because the premise is you don't love yourself. God is calling you to some self-love. And it's not self-worship. It's not self-idolatry. It's simple love. Lift your hands right now. And don't just lift your hand, but lift your heart. Don't just lift your heart, but lift your narrative. Lift your story. I mean, all the way down to how the circumstances of your birth and who you were born to and what happened and what you were robbed of, so you think, or what happened around you. Whatever you think have been your disadvantages in life, whatever you think has given you the short end of the stick, even your, 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 your frustrations from today, the stuff about your career and your education that frustrates you, Lift that to the Lord. And I want you to take the first step, which is love Him. I love, Lord, um, the very fact that we're here and saved and can sit under this word is proof that you love us. The fact that we hear your voice uh, uh, and the fact that we know that there is a plan. We may not know what it is, but uh, we have an anchor in us that you love us. And we know you loved us because you've not allowed our adversary to devour us. You've not allowed what should have overwhelmed us to do so. You've kept us alive. And you've not kept us alive just to look at us. You've kept us alive uh, to continually, continue in every day in every way exhibit your love for us now I know this is going to feel unusual but the Lord wants some repentance out of you for self hatred father we lift our hands to you in any area in ourselves whether it's because of us or because of our story or because of what people have done or said anything that was not every vo uh, void conversation whether it's mom or dad or granddaddy or whoever taught us that hating ourselves was righteousness will you reach 
deep in the core of who we are and where we've been and pull the roots out violently of self-resentment, of self-hatred in the name of Jesus. It's been masquerading as insecurity. It's been masquerading as fear. It's been masquerading as anxiety or nervousness. But what's really been in operation is a very, 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 very deep wall of self-resentment where we've not learned fully how to appreciate how you've made us, how to like, how you made us, how to use, how you made us to give you glory. So right here, in the name of Jesus, let the love of God be set abroad in this place and break the yoke of guilt, of shame, of comparison, of embarrassment, of resentment, of regret, of anger, of bitterness, anything operating in us that we don't fully see or comprehend that's stopping us from living at the level you called us to live at because we've not learned to love ourselves. Fill us up, my God, so that we can learn to love. I know that we were trained to believe that we were weird and different and abnormal and not worth it and left to side. But right here and right now, we come out of agreement and we divorce every lie of the enemy that brings us in agreement with self-destructive cycles and self-destructive behavior. Teach us as of this very day to love ourselves. Teach us how. We don't know how, but teach us how to say no to bad relationships. Teach us how to say no to impulsive behavior. Teach us how to resist addictions, desires that change us at the identity level and help us to love ourselves. Lord, do it in our hearts until we know how to say no. Do it in our heart until we don't compromise our boundaries. Do it in our hearts until we only invite relationships to help us love ourselves more than what we did before. Show us, show us, show us, show us, show us.